Welcome to the final session of the conference. Uh, this workshop called Co-Occurring Co SUD and MI Advanced Addiction Medicine Case-Based Discussion. Uh, the workshop will address co-occurring disorders in patients with substance use disorder and we'll use case discussion to consider treatment and management alternatives that minimize the potential for prescribed medication misuse. We have two experienced addiction psychiatrists who will be leading the session. And this is intended as a discussion, the, a case discussion session. So please, uh, we want conversation. So when you have something to say, please unmute yourself. As you got into the, the call, everybody was muted. So unmute yourself to speak. And then as soon as you're done speaking, please mute yourself again. And if you'd rather put something in the, in the uh, chat box, that's fine. But um, we, you know, a discussion would be the, uh, uh, the better alternative. Um, so our first speaker is Dr. Ashwin Patkar. He's certified in psychiatry with the American Board of Neurology and Psychiatry, the subspecialty certification in addiction psychiatry, addiction medicine, and pain medicine. Currently, Dr. Patkar is chief of psychiatry at Avance Avant Care in Raleigh, North Carolina, professor of psychiatry at Rush University in Chicago. He has over 25 years of clinical and scientific experience with expertise in psychopharmacology, dual diagnosis, integration of medical care and behavioral health, and pain and addiction issues. Dr. Patkar is currently the president of the North Carolina chapter of ASAM. Our second speaker, Dr. Tom Penders, is a psychiatrist at Lakeside Psychiatric Hospital, part of the Walter B. Jones Alcohol and Drug Treatment Center in Greenville, North Carolina. He is an affiliate professor at the Brody School of Medicine at East Carolina University. Welcome, Drs. Pender and Patkar. Good to be here. Thank you. So, uh, Dr. Patkar is going to uh, introduce some concepts of uh, co occurring uh, addiction uh, and mental disorders. Thank you. So uh, first, yes. welcome everyone uh, in terms of uh, joining this uh, case-based discussion. As Sarah pointed out, we want this to be interactive. So please feel free to use the chat box uh, as generously as you can. Uh, if somebody wants to uh, have a more of a dialogue, I will be happy to entertain that. Uh, also, welcome to all of you. This, I think, has been a unique year in terms of challenges of having uh, conferences. And uh, I think the Governor's Institute has done a fantastic job in terms of putting this together, uh, having the kind of flexibility we need. And then for all of you to join, you know, usually these meetings involve a lot of networking and face-to-face -face, uh, interactions, which we can't have. Um, uh, we do hope to put 2020 behind us pretty quickly and hope for better times next year. So, uh, uh, the way we are going to frame this is I'm going to go over some of the data in terms of co-occurring disorders or dual diagnosis. And then uh, my good friend and colleague Tom is going to go through the cases. Um, uh, these cases don't have an absolute right or wrong answer. Uh, these are uh, cases which uh, we hope would generate discussions and the rationale. Um, and um, uh, feel free to chime in at that point. Um, uh, Tom uh, is hobnobbing with the elites in Hyannis uh, in Cape Cod, uh, while I'm stuck here in Cary, uh, like all of you. So uh, uh, that's uh, one point. But so what we are really hoping to do is uh, just recognize that the patients we see with substance use disorders in our practice, um, by and large, uh, they are not straightforward. Uh, they are uh, complex. And there was an old saying that uh, uh, if you think uh, that complex uh, uh, problems have simple solutions, uh, you are wrong. So uh, we'll discuss some of the complexities and the way we manage them. And then really look at what are the appropriate pharmacological approaches. Uh, so, and then uh, move forward from that in terms of how we can use uh, these approaches so that we minimize the potential for uh, medication abuse. So let's move forward um, to the next slide. Uh, okay, great. So uh, so this is the largest study done called the NISAC study that uh, uh, 
the National Epidemiological Survey on Alcohol and Alcohol-Related Conditions. And uh, what it really tells you is that the, the norm with patients with uh, substance use disorders um, is that they are going to have a psychiatric disorder. So if you look at alcohol dependence, the odds ratios are 15 times higher of having a psychiatric disorder. If you want to look at mood disorder, your uh, odds of having a substance use disorder are eight and a half times. If you have an anxiety disorder, it's about six times um, and so forth with ADHD, uh, uh, 6.2 times um, uh, and so forth. So uh, those are the norms and personality disorders uh, we should not neglect. Uh, they have about 10 times higher rates of having substance use disorders. In this context, I think it's worth looking at the recent uh, uh, report from the CDC in the COVID-19 epidemic. I don't know how many of you saw that. Uh, this was a survey done uh, of over 5,000 uh, Americans in uh, June 2020. And what they found was around 40% uh, or so uh, reported a mental health or substance use problem. Uh, specifically, 13% uh, reported that they had initiated or escalated substance use, and around 30% had uh, uh, occurrence or recurrence of anxiety or depressive disorders and a significant proportion had uh, 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 symptoms suggestive of uh, post-traumatic or acute stress disorder. So in COVID times, uh, 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 these odds ratios which you see are likely to be higher. The, uh, also the CDC data from June 2020 uh, indicated that um, the highest rate uh, for substance use uh, initiation as well as uh, mental health uh, was between 18 to 24. So the younger population are finding it harder to cope uh, with this stress and it went down as age uh, increased. A couple of points here to know about the comorbidity rates. Uh, alcohol dependence which was the highest rates of co-occurring um, substance use disorder Alcohol dependence in combination with mood disorders carries uh, the highest rate of suicide. So that's just something to be mindful of. In general, having a psychiatric disorder as well as a substance use disorder is going to increase your risk for a suicide. Um, and given the context of increasing suicide rates in the US, we just have to be mindful of that. Uh, uh, let's move forward, Tom. Okay. So what is the nature in terms of uh, mechanism or uh, link uh, between substance use disorders and uh, psychiatric disorders? And basically uh, it's a bi-directional link. So if you have psychiatric disorders, they are strongly predictive of uh, development of substance use and vice versa. And uh, the data from this comes from really very well-designed uh, studies which examine populations uh, in adolescence and then track them into adulthood. So um, uh, you could actually see in adolescence if uh, uh, patients or rather populations develop substance use disorders uh, later on in adulthood, they had a higher risk of developing psychiatric disorders and vice versa. Uh, it's believed that the, there are shared uh, genetic mechanisms which might be contributing to some of this, uh, but the long longitudinal studies are the best available data. Uh, when we were at Duke, I was at Duke, we were involved in the Smoky Mountain study uh, from our Cherokee reservations in Asheville. And it was sim the, the studies have been published and it was quite comparable that uh, early onset of psychiatric disorders or substance use disorders were predictive of uh, later onset of uh, either of the two. And of course, they have an adverse outcome on course and um, of the illness uh, and treatment response. So. Uh, that's why we are here, how we can address uh, uh, these disorders. So uh, that's my spiel to start. And uh, we are going to move into cases pretty quickly. And Tom is going to take over in terms of case discussion. Tom? OK, so uh, just to <clears throat> reinforce what Dr. Pratkar uh, has uh, already said, uh, it's, it's uh, both a challenge uh, and, a, uh, and an opportunity that most of the patients who present to us are complex in, their, in nature. Uh, and the evidence that we have from research studies generally uh, relates to pure culture problems. So we can study alcohol use disorders and determine what is the best treatment. 
Uh, there's less uh, literature and evidence relating to alcohol use disorders and depressive disorders or schizophrenic disorders and use of cannabis, for instance. Uh, so we're left uh, trying to translate the evidence using our clinical judgment uh, into an approach to a particular patient. So we've chosen two co-occurring conditions here uh, to look at in a little bit more detail uh, in, in the hopes we can generate some discussion uh, and even some disagreement about how uh, we may approach these individual cases. So our first case is the case of AH. Uh, combat-related uh, post-traumatic stress disorder. Well, I'm uh, having a little bit of problem here. Hang on. Can't uh, read this. I can't read the whole slide. Oh, okay. I can read it, Tom, and uh, I think uh, okay, Sarah okay. and Peter can read it. Okay, go ahead. Yeah, so we have a 33-year-old female with recent hospital admission after ingestion of lorazepam, hydrocodone, and trazodone while feeling overwhelmed, quote-unquote, with hopelessness and helplessness. She's a former U.S. Navy nurse with over 12 years with several deployments in Middle East war zones. Uh, four years ago, during a convoy in Kuwait, she witnessed the death of a close female friend as a result of a roadside bombing. She retrieved and transported the body after. In the weeks following, she experienced increasing fearfulness and panic attacks, nightly nightmares with vivid images of friends' fatal injuries. Can we go to the next slide, Tom? No? Placed on medical leave, but with persistent symptoms, she was returned to the US and medically discharged under honorable conditions with the diagnosis of PTSD. She returned to North Carolina, but separated to live with aunt and her eight-year-old daughter. She continued to have attacks of panic twice a day, persistent dysphoria, irritability, and social withdrawal. She struggled to re-engage with civilian life and with the urging of her aunt, enrolled in a community college. Next one. Okay. You got it. Yeah. Tom, can you read it or uh, should I proceed? Yeah, I can, I, can re I can read it now. So yeah, okay. So she seeks care from her primary care physician who prescribes lorazepam a milligram three times a day along with desvenlafaxine 50 milligrams per day to uh, treat presumably uh, patient's anxiety. Uh, she visits a local mental health uh, center but indicates that she really couldn't connect with her therapist there. She goes on and continues to have severe daytime anxiety, uh, panic attacks and traumatic nightmares over the next several months frequently taking extra dosages of lorazepam against the advice of her primary care physician. She recently suffered a back strain. She was prescribed oxycodone that she takes whenever her pain interferes with her attending classes. The current crisis follows an evening of drinking during which she is overwhelmed with financial concerns. She denies suicidal intent, but indicates that she just wanted to go to sleep. The records indicate a recent hospitalization at a psychiatric facility after, the, uh, after she was assaulted by a male friend. The patient herself indicates only that she and her friend had too much to drink. She's now referred to you for evaluation and follow-up care. So with the established diagnosis of post-traumatic stress disorder, what role do benzodiazepines have in the management of the associated anxiety, nightmares, or sleep-related A, benzodiazepines are commonly prescribed for PTSD. They appear to have some efficacy in moderating anxiety and sleep problems, while psychotherapeutic efforts are the mainstay of treatment. B, 
Benzodiazepines serve a valuable and primary role in the treatment of post-traumatic stress disorder. C, there's little evidence for the efficacy of benzodiazepines in the treatment of post-traumatic stress disorder. They should never be used for short-term relief of anxiety associated with PTSD. Or D, benzodiazepines are likely to interfere with long-term goals and are relatively contraindicated. So we would invite your comments. Uh, and uh, if you're interested in unmuting yourself and making some statement about this particular dilemma, which is not an uncommon one, uh, please do so. You could use the chat box also, by the way. Could do what Dr. Shukla did yesterday and randomly call on people. <laughs> okay, I can't see everybody here. So, uh, Ashwin, can you see the attendees? No, I don't think we can. I mean, uh, I think uh, we can see the group chat. I mean, that's about it. But I can't see any anyone else. Uh, I don't know. Uh, Oh yeah, I can see. I, I can see some. I can see Robbie Forbes and Pam. And yeah, I, I mean, I can't see. I mean, I uh, I can see the names of everyone. I mean, uh, if you want, you can start calling upon people. But I don't want to put anybody on the spot. Uh, 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 I think Eugene may have a comment. Okay. Yeah. It, uh, there's I, there's something in the chat. Should we start with that? Yeah, let's start with that before I start okay. calling on people who are on the Zoom link. He says, <laughs> he or she says, unsure. I'm in pain management. And I do not treat PTSD. We try to limit benzos with our pain management. Okay. And then another comment, I agree with D, would not say never, but not good long term. Yeah, I see Josh Dittmer saying D and then Nick saying agree with D. Um, so, uh, uh, so here's what, uh, Tom, you are, I, I'll make a couple of comments about the mechanism and I'll let Tom speak also. Um, so the question that comes up, you know, with the answer, uh, uh, the D, which is, you know, they're relatively contraindicated and there's little evidence for efficacy of benzodiazepines in the treatment of PTSD. Uh, so if you have, there were four randomized controlled trials done to the best of my knowledge of benzodiazepines for PTSD, not case reports, but randomized controlled trials. And um, uh, none of them showed uh, uh, an efficacy which was clinically or statistically significant over placebo. Um, the, what is more interesting is if you look at, uh, and I find this very helpful if you're going to explain to patients with PTSD why you don't want to use benzodiazepines to treat anxiety is that the mechanism in the brain of panic in PTSD versus panic in anxiety disorder or panic disorder is different. Uh, so the locus ceruleus is the key component in the brain very, which is implicated in a panic disorder in particular and anxiety disorder. And uh, in... Uh, in PTSD, uh, it's broader than that. It's not just the locus ceruleus. You get implications on the memory center in your hippocampus. Uh, you also get uh, your frontal cortex being implicated. So uh, what happens with uh, treatment of panic disorder and anxiety or panic is you're focusing on the locus ceruleus and it's effective. Um, while in PTSD, you start interfering with functions of your hippocampus where learning and memory is located, your frontal cortex, and that's not that effective. One of the best ways to demonstrate that was done by giving the benzodiazepine antagonist flumazil in, uh, in models of uh, panic. And so if you go with that, you can actually provoke uh, panic uh, in patients with panic disorder, but it really had no effect in PTSD. So uh, it's useful to know that there are some uh, mechanism of action differences between the two conditions. But, uh, Tom, you want to kind of talk about in general guidelines and efficacy? 
Yeah, sure. So, I mean, I think general guidelines are that benzodiazepine should be avoided uh, in treating anxiety associated with PTSD. And and, and you've uh, spoken about the neurobiology, uh, 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 Ashwin. So I'll comment that the psychotherapeutic role here is to uh, try to decrease or unlearn those overlearned experiences that are associated with a traumatic event that has caused the PTSD and the associated anxiety. And that benzodiazepines work against that uh, unlearning uh, in the sense that if you suppress the anxiety, uh, you're, you're not really going to be get, getting to the, to the point of uh, desensitizing what the original traumatic event was. So uh, uh, I think of these uh, answers here, and uh, I think the first answer we can, uh, we can eliminate, the benzodiazepines are commonly prescribed for PTSD, but increasingly there are efforts, particularly when the Veterans Administration system to uh, uh, eliminate those. And, uh, and I think there's, they've had a lot of success with that. And uh, the statement B, uh, benzodiazepines can serve a valuable and primary role in the treatment of PTSD is overtly false. I think that the evidence would uh, weigh against that. Uh, and C appears to be somewhat true. I mean, one, someone could use benzodiazepines on a very short basis. Uh, the original indication for benzodiazepines was for short-term uh, use in uh, situations that are associated with acute, acute stress reactions. Uh, or adjustment disorders, um, generally 10 days or two week courses. Uh, and uh, D seems to be uh, the most reasonable answer here is that di benzodiazepines likely to interfere with long-term goals and are relatively contraindicated. Uh, does anyone uh, wanna make a comment or have a question about what we've... Uh, so Tom, I think uh, there are a few co comments in the group chat about uh, C as being uh, the preferred response. Yeah, that's uh, okay. Yeah, that's yeah. what I would. That's what I would choose. Yeah. So uh, one thing I would like to comment about the C response, which is, I guess, people have, and I have uh, used uh, benzodiazepines uh, some for short-term treatment of panic in PTSD, is. Uh, Often one of the complicating factors with PTSD is somebody already has an anxiety disorder which is pre-existing before PTSD and it's very difficult to tease it out or they have a panic disorder or they have depression. Um, if you are going to use benzodiazepines for short-term use of anxiety, be very clear about what the short-term use is. Okay, so uh, otherwise you're going to find yourself getting into a scenario where uh, you're not going to recognize whether the person is using it on a regular basis and then the complications of withdrawal symptoms or rebound anxiety. And it's a good way to see the relief you, the person is going to get with a low dose of a benzodiazepine. Uh, so when the studies were done, particularly a panic disorder, uh, that was actually a predictor of response in the studies. So if somebody has no response with uh, uh, you know, half a milligram of clonazepam, uh, you should start getting worried because half a milligram of clonazepam is going to reduce some symptoms of anxiety uh, and probably is cut down on the intensity of panic. So it will give you an idea and it's good to frame it that way when you treat patients also. I'm going to see how you're going to do. Most people often respond to this dose and we don't need to use this dose to, uh, as Tom suggested, you know, uh, block your anxiety completely because that's not helpful. So we are just going to manage it. So, yeah. There's two additional comments. One is uh, the problem with C as it seems to leave the door open to long-term use in PTSD. And the other one is uh, what is the role of SSRIs in this case? Um, okay, well, uh, I think Tom, uh, I can take the first one. You could take the second one, the SSRI role. Okay, oh, all right, okay. Yeah, so the, I would agree that the problem with C is that if you use it short term, uh, it will lead uh, open to long term. And that is, I think, the reason why I mentioned early on that you need to frame what short term is. Uh, uh, if you look at various guidelines, uh, the maximum duration, they would say is about six weeks. Um, 
you need to frame it in the context that there is not going to be any dose escalation. You're using it for symptom relief for somebody to uh, wait till their SSRIs or SNRIs or other treatments, including behavioral therapies, are going to kick in. So it's primarily a bridging role you use till your first line medications are going to start having effect. Uh, uh, now, some people I can see are saying uh, it may be difficult to get them back. Um, and it depends really on how you uh, frame it. Uh, if the framing is such that the person feels, you know, it can continue, uh, then it becomes uh, a challenge. Uh, Tom, you want to address the SSRI? And, yeah, uh, yeah. So, yeah, there are uh, several studies now that show the effectiveness of SSRIs uh, in terms of producing positive outcomes together with uh, psychotherapeutic interventions with SSRIs, so both uh, in the, uh, the uh, sexual assault literature as well as combat-related PTSD. I, I, I do want to make a, an additional comment and, and maybe ask uh, Ashwin or others who may be interested in answering. Uh, of course, it's very easy to start a benzodiazepine and it's some, a lot of times very difficult to stop it. Uh, even if you uh, indicate up front that this is a short-term goal. And there is a, a fair amount of uh, conversation and uh, d uh, discussion now going on about when patients call in crisis who are under our care for an addictive disorder, and they say, I really, I really need some Valium or I really need some Ativan or whatever, because they're in some sort of crisis. Uh, on the one hand, there's the argument that if you do not prescribe, there is a fairly good chance you might lose that patient. That is, the patient won't come back. Uh, and the other side of it is you don't really want to prescribe benzodiazepines because they're reinforcing and they uh, sort of complicate addictions treatment. Uh, and uh, increasingly what I'm seeing, and I, I'd ask uh, Ashwin if he's seeing the same thing, is a sort of a more permissive attitude uh, towards saying, okay, I'll give you a couple of days of benzodiazepines to help you through it, but I need to see you soon uh, so we can begin to process some of this. Uh, Ashwin, what do, you, what do you think about that? I would agree with you, Tom, that you, I mean, you see these crises commonly. Uh, my general approach about you know, using benzodiazepines um, in high risk population is what is the level of monitoring you can ensure? You know, a patient who you hardly know, you, he calls you and says, I'm in a crisis and wanting benzodiazepines is very different than a patient you have known for a decade. And he calls in and he has his mother or spouse on the phone and saying something which you, you believe in. And you can, uh, so I think it kind of differs on, I always look at any high risk situation is, and in this case, prescribing benzodiazepines is, uh, can you really ensure monitoring? Uh, uh, and it's the same whether you use it for short-term treatment of PTSD. I mean, uh, if you're going to use short-term, you've got to see them quickly. Uh, and if you, if you can't see them in four weeks, I mean, it's really not short-term. So yes, you, I see that happening. Um, uh, and I, I've seen that done in a framework where monitoring is done properly. Patients are asked to come in the day uh, next day or the day later. Uh, the, the other side of the argument is, you know, the patient is going to go either relapse or use alcohol or end up in the ER uh, and uh, be a burden. So there are those, I mean, it's a fine balancing act. Um, the, uh, uh, if somebody has risk factors, then, you know, you really should be really careful. I mean, if somebody has a history of obviously misusing benzodiazepines, uh, you're not going to go uh, give it, or somebody's actively drinking or using drugs. Um, but I do see that uh, they are used in certain instances. And um, you know, if you monitor it carefully, you might be able to uh, alleviate the crisis. But let's see if we have any more. Yeah, I, I like I like that. Uh, I like that answer, Ashwin. It essentially the the, the principle being that uh, you you can enter into a situation that has some bit of elevated risk as long as you can uh, manage that risk. Yeah. Are there any other comments about that? For... Um, I think there are comments about, uh, I think from Patrick is, uh, 
if a patient has demonstrated poor adherence, in this case, Tom, I think the patient has, which is with the lorazepam, uh, then uh, obviously there is an increased risk, which I would agree. Uh, okay. Any other comments? Another comment was, uh, um, what exactly were the kind of crisis uh, which uh, uh, we were referring to in terms of the patients uh, calling and, and requesting medications? Uh, the patient took too many lorazepam uh, in the context of uh, drinking heavily uh, and ended up ended up in the ED. Okay. So, so I'm going to uh, move. Uh, yeah, let's move on. on okay. Okay. So does this patient have a substance use disorder in addition to PTSD? A, she misuses lorazepam has not yet developed a substance use disorder, but she is, quote, at risk. She clearly has developed a pattern of addictive use of lorazepam, and she deserves a uh, diagnosis of sedative use disorder, severe. C, she does not have a substance use disorder, but has been undertreated for P her PTSD. Or D, she has a sedative hypnotic disorder. Further screening for alcohol use disorder is, is advised. So would we make a diagnosis of uh, sedative use disorder or lorazepam use disorder or benzodiazepine use disorder in this patient? Uh, or is there some other, uh, in which case, of course, we would spend time addressing that, or is there some other approach we should be more focused on at this point? We have any comments, uh, Sarah, from? Yeah, I think, I think there are several comments. Yeah. So there are comments saying we can make a diagnosis, but we don't have enough to consider it as severe. Uh, the comments where we feel there isn't enough information to make a DSM-5 diagnosis. So they're having different, which I think is the way the discussion should be. Okay. Here's a vote for C. Okay. Okay. Would the, would the, would the person who uh, made that comment be interested in expanding upon that? If so, you need to unmute yourself. I made the comment I think she's treating her PTSD with the lorazepam and the other um, benzo, and, but her PTSD has not been PTSD has not been treated. She is a high risk because she's forming a pattern, or addictive pattern. I don't know. I'm just wildly guessing here, Dr. Pender. Okay. Well, I'm I'm agreeing with you. <laughs> I, I think we've had a, you know, we've had a, a, some episodes of overuse of, ben, of lorazepam or mm -hmm. uh, aberrant use, if you will, uh, but we haven't really established that she's got a lorazepam or a benzodiazepine use disorder, mm -hmm. uh, but we clearly have not done everything we can for her PTSD at this point. So I'm going to move to the next slide because that's a really good segue. So she presents to the VA clinic. She's tearful, remorseful. She denied suicidal intent for her overdose, but she explains that her anxiety only responds to uh, lorazepam. What would you advise about her continued use of lorazepam? A, you recognize her suffering, but you do not believe continued use of lorazepam advisable, as it will probably complicate treatment. B, she should never take lorazepam. Perhaps Zolpidem would be helpful in managing sleep problems. C, patients suffering from combat-related PTSD are at greater risk for substance use disorders. She has been overusing lorazepam and she should never be prescribed substances with addictive properties. Or D, it's okay to continue the lorazepam if she agrees to use only as prescribed and referral made to the PTSD counseling program. Can you hear me? Yes, yep. Kelly. Yeah, okay. So I think that you need to ask her first, like how the lorazepam was working for her, you know, 
um, and then you could decide whether um, she could continue to use lorazepam. I mean, was she just taking it because she was at feeling like, okay, nothing's working, I'm gonna keep trying these. And, you know, if that she felt that she was getting some benefit, but not enough, then maybe, you know, prescribe her that and refer her or say no. Um, the, look, let's have a talk. You were trying this, you weren't getting anywhere with it. Let's go back and offer you something that actually will help. Any, any other comments? There's several I think comments Tom, uh, see. Yeah, we have uh, t uh, quite a few people uh, choosing C as, uh, as their option. Um, so, um, This is a, a common point of view uh, and, and one I think that's probably defensible from the literature. Uh, and again, as I mentioned before, against uh, the other side of the argument here is that uh, outcomes for treat treatment of any addictive disorder or really any psychiatric disorder are related directly to their retention and treatment Sometimes we have to make compromises to retain people in treatment. So I'm not saying that's the correct answer, but I'm just making that point. Um, other comments? I think, uh, I think there's a comment uh, that it's uh, one thing to fail in your treatment of a disorder, it's quite another to create a new one. So I guess it's uh, referring to the fact that you might create an iatrogenic uh, substance use disorder, in this case, uh, sedative hypnotic use disorder. Right. Mm -hmm. so, do, we uh, also, do we also have to worry about her potentially experiencing withdrawal symptoms? Like if she's been abusing it and using it with alcohol, I'm wondering about <clears throat> if you take her off quickly um, or you don't know what else she's on, you could risk serious harm. So uh, I think we're assuming here, and of course it's a, an excellent point. If somebody's on lorazepam for a period of time, you can't stop it abruptly. You could need to taper it. Uh, I think we're assuming here that she just got out of the hospital and she was not discharged in lorazepam, although it, it didn't say that explicitly here. Uh, so if she's on lorazepam and has been on lorazepam for some period of time, uh, then it needs to be tapered. Uh, if she was discharged from the hospital after having it tapered, then of course you probably would be reluctant to uh, to add lorazepam. Uh, and I and I want to just uh, remind whoever made the, uh, the comment about her under treatment of uh, PTSD and the role of SSRIs uh, is also relevant here. Yeah, I would We're agree that other uh, comments. I think, no, I think we have it, but I would agree that here the the issue really becomes if you're going to treat her PTSD, then you use the first line pharmacological medications for that. And I, I think uh, a lot of what you may be uh, looking at are symptoms which are not adequately addressed uh, from her current treatment regimen. Um, I'm assuming here that because the patient was in the hospital, that lorazepam was discontinued. And, uh, and the reason uh, the patient is tearful, remorseful is um, also the fact that, uh, you know, she is seeking uh, lorazepam to some extent. Okay, any other, any other comments or does anybody else have any questions about any of these choices? Yeah, there's a comment from the, um, the, the person who suggested the, the, the iatrogenic he says, how do you taper a benzo in the outpatient setting in someone who has already demonstrated an inability to take it as scheduled? That's the point. It's, it's, uh, it's, it's difficult, uh, I agree, uh, but it can be done on an outpatient basis. Generally, it requires slow tapering over a period of approximately six to eight weeks. Uh, that's been my experience, uh, uh, Ashwin. 
I think it's a good point in the sense like for this particular patient, is it challenging to do it? Um, so uh, I agree with Tom that you can do it on an outpatient basis. I probably have three or four patients I'm doing it at the moment. Uh, so uh, the key issue here, by the way, if people want to refer to outpatient detox, uh, uh, the best reference is the Ashton protocols developed by Dr. Ashton from UK. They're very old, but they are... Uh, they have been implemented quite widely, and the key issue is slow, what, what Tom said. Um, uh, the way I look at it is if you want to do outpatient taper, have a few things which are necessary before you start that taper. One is that you have time to see the patient every week or every other week. So in other words, you're not giving medications more than a week or, other, uh, uh, or two weeks. Uh, you have a caregiver who is reliable, who is supervising the medication. And then you have the capability of uh, monitoring, uh, usually by urine drug screen, a quantitative test so that you know that what you are being prescribed is being taken and uh, not some other benzodiazepines or for that matter, any other drug. Uh, and the fourth is that they're engaged in behavioral counseling. If you have that, you can start it. Uh, often you're gonna find that the six to eight weeks may extend to 12 weeks or 14 weeks. But the issue with the taper is that even if you halt the taper, it's going to go in only one way. And that's when I start taper, I usually spend about half an hour or so explaining how it works and uh, what is the agreement. Uh, and the backup is if it, if it fails, then the taper will be uh, done in an inpatient setting. Uh, but, uh, but there are ways where you can do it. It's not very common uh, for everyone, certainly those have risk factors. And if somebody has, for example, opioids on board like this patient will be extra careful, uh, but it, it can be done. Okay. Does anybody have a comment to make about the Zolt Zolpidem to help manage sleep problems? Um, There's another question that came in. Yeah, I think uh, Kawe has asked a question, Tom, about how do you manage patients that come to you for treatment of opioid use and receive benzodiazepines from a different provider? Yes, hi. Uh, thank you, uh, Ashman and Dr. Pendris, for that. I, I think it's a rather, I th I'm really enjoying this discussion. I find it quite helpful, but uh, um, I'm finding increasing number of patients who um, are coming to treatment and have been on benzodiazepines long-term, either by their primary care provider or by um, a, 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 a mental health provider, uh, they don't get uh, MAT, uh, buprenorphine, or suboxone there. They come to you for that, and uh, I find that particularly challenging because I don't want to deny them treatment uh, of their opiate use disorder, um, and it's also difficult to uh, demand another physician from you know, changing their prescribing habits, and I uh, feel that if I tell them they have to stop using their other provider, that it would lose the patient from follow-up. I've, I've dealt with it by putting them on a, a treatment contract for reducing their dose. I've also insisted on changing from alprazolam to more stable forms on azepam or Valium, but I, I wanted to get some thought from the group on that. So uh, I, uh, I'll make a comment, Ashwin, then I'll invite you uh, uh, to uh, ch chime in. Uh, uh, so increasingly, uh, I'm assuming you're talking about buprenorphine maintenance here, is that right? Uh, yes. Okay, so I, I would contrast that with methadone maintenance, but uh, in, with buprenorphine maintenance, increasingly, I believe that there is a, uh, a feeling uh, amongst providers that uh, we should not be discontinuing treatment of buprenorphine for patients who are using benzodiazepines. In fact, there was a recent observational study that showed that patients on, uh, on uh, uh, benzodiazepines were more likely to continue their treatment uh, on buprenorphine than those who didn't. Now, I'm not advocating uh, having patients use bu uh, benzodiazepines. I'm certainly not advocating prescribing them. Uh, but if you have a patient who is on them and in your buprenorphine program, uh, I, th I think it calls and, uh, for a motivational interviewing approach to try to identify why that's dangerous and why the patient needs to be motivated to get off of them. Uh, I, I posed this question to a very large clinic at Boston University 
uh, and they do exactly the same thing. They, they refer their patients for motivational interviewing uh, to just discuss the use of benzodiazepines while they continue in the clinic uh, for uh, buprenorphine treatment. Uh, the, the split treatment between another provider providing uh, substance use uh, or, you know, controlled substances, that's a bit uh, more sticky and I would be a little bit more firm myself about uh, making sure that all controlled substance came from one source. Ashwin, do you want to comment on that? I think it's a great question Kaveh has proposed. So if you look at you know the context of when you see, and I, I also, by the way, see had patients come to me who are on long-term benzodiazepines. Is, so what is the risk of benzodiazepine? Forget about methadone. This is buprenorphine we are talking about. In buprenorphine, like uh, uh, if somebody is being prescribed buprenorphine, what is the biggest risk? So the biggest risk is somebody is going to inject your buprenorphine and inject the benzodiazepines with the hat. Uh, and they overdose and die. So that is the data in terms of the absolute risk. Is there a risk that the person on benzodiazepine is going to relapse into opioids? And there is very little data to the best of my knowledge. I mean, Tom, you may know data which is different, but most of the data has been from methadone programs. So in terms of the buprenorphine, the risk that, uh, that an, a benzodiazepine is going to make them relapse to opioid use, I'm not talking to benzodiazepine use. Um, I've not seen that data. Um, again, I'm not advocating that you should be prescribing benzodiazepines. Uh, uh, the person who has a history of misusing substance, uh, benzodiazepines or who clearly is using it in a manner that is you know, risky, I mean, you would not prescribe opioids or for that matter, you would address that as a primary problem. But I'm assuming, Kaveh, the people who are coming to you have a primary issue with opioid use disorder and um, yeah. yeah and how you're yes. going to is that so uh, if somebody on a long-term benzodiazepine use i would not consider that as an absolute contraindication to treating opioid use disorder okay. so uh, uh yeah no thank you that's that's helpful and i uh, that's the approach that i have taken uh my one of my concerns is and, and i'm frankly not so worried about overdose risk of the combination of buprenorphine and benzodiazepines because I'm, I would be more worried about the patient overdosing on opiates uh, if buprenorphine treatment was withheld. Um, I am uh, having conversations with them just to try to make the patients understand that the benzodiazepine epidemic is alive and well and uh, we don't quite have a medication as effective as buprenorphine to treat that. And uh, so my goal is to try to help them with their benzo dependence uh, as well. And I find it a very, very challenging topic to discuss in, in clinic, uh, one that needs to be addressed. And I try to continue to work on it and try to get their counselors engaged in that effort as well. I think that's a good approach. I mean, uh, if somebody is Picking up their prescription of benzodiazepines without early refills, without lost prescriptions, without anything else from the urine drug screen suggesting they're misusing and they are not on alprazolam, like you said, uh, that's a different patient than the patient who's coming to you uh, uh, with uh, you know urine drug screens which are inconsistent and having multiple providers. So I do think that it's very important as clinicians that we uh, we look at the individual risk, not an overall uh, reported risk. Yeah, so it makes sense to uh, emphasize, as uh, Ashwin alluded to, that uh, if, if you're talking about methadone, and it's not an uncommon situation in a methadone program to have a patient relapse into use of heroin and benzodiazepines while they're continuing to receive methadone. This is this is a reason for uh, inpatient stabilization, in my view. That's a much more dangerous uh, situation. Good, yeah. Uh, Mike uh, Lancaster, of course, who all of us know well, has asked, uh, I think, an important question. If it's SSRIs for long-term treatment for chronic anxiety, should one use low doses or high doses for best response? So, uh, Tom, should I take that and then you can chime in? Yeah, sure. Yeah. So, uh, you know, if you look at SSRI studies uh, in, um, 
uh, ang uh, the whole spectrum of anxiety disorders uh, the uh, the anxiety disorder where you need the highest doses is obsessive, obsessive compulsive disorder so ocd you need to reach sometimes supra maximum doses i have a patient with refractory ocd now who is on 300 mg of uh, sertraline uh, who has responded uh, for a panic disorder uh, uh, in my experience is good to start at a very low dose uh, they have been shown to be sensitive to the effects of uh, ssris and and even what we would consider therapeutic doses for depression so it's good to start very slow and see how they do uh, now as you uh, titrate the dose if they can tolerate the dose without uh, uh, any substantial side effects uh, i would go into the dose which is used in the generally the depressive range before i would consider them a non responder uh for ocd you would often have to go about that dose uh, generally the studies uh, for ptsd of paxil uh, or or sertraline they had the dose in the antidepressant range so i don't know whether mike that answers your question but uh that's what i found uh, to work in clinical settings tom what has been your experience? so you know my my experience is and i th i think some of the literature supports that uh treatment of anxiety disorders requires a higher uh, dose than generally we use for antidepressant for SSRIs. Um, and I agree with Ashwin that sometimes patients with panic disorder are very sensitive. So you have to start low and gradually build up, but to suppress anxiety. And that I think would include anxiety related to post-traumatic stress disorder. You're probably talking about a higher dose than we ordinarily associate with the antidepressant response. Great. So, should we move on, uh, Tom? Okay. Let's uh, see what happens with AH here. So, AH was taking oxycodone as needed for back pain. What are the risks and benefits of using opioids together with benzodiazepines for chronic back pain? There is little justification for use of the two agents together. There is no problem with prescribing both drugs after establishing an indication for each. If a patient with a psychiatric disorder and a substance use disorder, the risk of fatal overdose would cause me to hesitate using both agents together. And while acknowledging the risk of prescribing this combination, it might be necessary here. I would provide careful monitoring and early intervention for aberrant use. So this is the issue of the opioids and the benzodiazepines which someone uh, touched upon earlier. Uh, what would be your approach uh, to this situation? We have a A vote and a C vote. Okay. And then a between C and D vote, closer to C. <laughs> <laughs> That's hedging your bets there. Uh huh. Okay. All right. Yes, it is. So uh, I would only comment number one is. Uh, this pair of AH had suffered a back strain and there was little justification for use of oxy, uh, oxy in the first place. <laughs> uh, so to add, add a benzodiazepine to that would be, uh, would be troublesome in my view. We're, get, we're, we're getting off into the area where we're no longer practicing evidence-based medicine and this is no longer a judgment, but a, probably a poor practice. Ashwin, do you uh, comment? Yeah, so you know it's interesting when you see uh, patients both for pain uh, and for addiction. It's, uh, you know, I, I do both. So uh, one thing I would agree, which uh, Thomas said, that uh, the evidence is to the contrary uh, for back pain actually for uh, efficacy of opioids. So a combination of Tylenol and Motrin is uh, more efficacious than uh, than uh, opioids. So in terms of actually using it to treat back pain. Uh, as an as-needed basis, there's little rationale. Um, having said that, if you look, and I would agree, by the way, that if patient has a psychiatric disorder and a substance use disorder, uh, both are risk factors uh, for uh, a variety of uh, complicating issues, including uh, overdose risk. So I would agree with uh, that. Uh, that's that risk should make people hesitate. 
uh, or at least start figuring out how you're going to monitor the risk. Now, uh, I'm not so sure how many of uh, you would be treating these kinds of patients, but there are my friend and colleague, Steve Packen treats them, uh, or used to treat them before he retired at Duke uh, extensively. So you get refractory complex pain syndrome patients with psychiatric disorders who have failed all eventualities uh, have, and have reached a state of stability on an opioid and a benzodiazepine which are being monitored for such high risk prescriptions. Uh, and there are these kinds of patients. Okay, uh, so I just want to throw it out there. I'm not saying that any of, I mean, that's a different population that's being managed in with a pain specialist with the kind of support uh, that you can have at a pain center. So this is not something that I would say uh, just do uh, without having that support. But if uh, that is managed well, and this includes the CDC guidelines of, you know, staying below 50 and then about below 90 and using uh, properly, uh, they can be managed and they are being managed. Uh, but in this particular instance, I would definitely go with, uh, with A and C. Uh, but the D1, which is uh, not many people have chosen, um, uh, that is not appropriate for this patient, but there are other instances uh, where patients are being managed with their option. Any other comments about this particular dilemma? That's it. Okay, we're gonna move on then. So, so what overall interventions might be suggested to help with the problems that AH presents to us? For A, educate the about the risk of untreated post-traumatic stress disorder, discontinue lorazepam, offer praesocin for sleep-related problems, schedule an appointment for the post-traumatic stress program and emphasize cognitive psychotherapy and continue desvenlafaxine. B, refer for orthopedic evaluation for evaluation of back pain, continue lorazepam but stop the opioid and refer to the PTSD treatment program. Stop all pharmacotherapy, refer to a therapist focusing on mindfulness meditation or discourage or discontinue uh, desvenlafaxine, begin fluoxetine, and increase trazodone while asking AH to consider referral to the PTSD program. So, uh, uh, Tom, there's a question. Uh, what role do non-psychiatric practitioners have in treatment of PTSD? So, could you elaborate on that? Okay, so I, I think there's no question that the guidelines call for com combined pharmacological and psychotherapeutic approach. Uh, and the psychotherapeutic approach might be individual cognitive therapy or group therapy or combination of those. Uh, uh, and so non-psychiatric providers would play a major role in providing the therapeutic psychotherapeutic support uh, for a patient like this, in my view. Well, absolutely, yeah. So, uh, for several A answers. So, prazosin for sleep related problems for nightmares for PTSD has clearly shown efficacy. There's been some negative studies, but uh, generally, this has become accepted treatment for nightmares uh, and uh, improves the sleep quality of patients with PTSD probably also plays a role in decreasing uh, some of the anxiety associated with PTSD as well. Uh, and of course, scheduling a point for the PTSD program is, is a critical piece of uh, what we should have done for AH from the beginning. Uh, and uh, we, could, we could argue that maybe fluoxacine should be started since she was on uh, venlafaxine and apparently didn't approve, but uh, we could also continue the desvenlafaxine. That would be my take. Ashwin? Yeah, I think A is uh, uh, the default answer. It's pretty comprehensive. Uh, so a couple of quick uh, uh, you know, comments. Um, I would agree with desvenlafaxine. Um, it's not approved, by the way, to treat PTSD. There are only two FDA-approved medications for PTSD. 
both are old SSRIs, Paxil and Zoloft. Uh, but uh, that doesn't mean that the other uh, medications are not effective. So uh, that is, uh, there are uh, different kinds of uh, psychotherapeutic approaches. Tom mentioned already about uh, how critical they are. Uh, they are basically variations of cognitive processing therapies and exposure therapies, some of which include EMDR, the eye movement therapies. Uh, but that is a key component of management of PTSD. So um, uh, emphasizing cognitive psychotherapy is, uh, is critical. Um, the, uh, the last one, which is, you know, discontinuing dust venlafaxin, begin uh, fluoxetine. Uh, so if somebody is not responding, it's, uh, you know, let's assume this person was on 100 milligrams of uh, dust venlafaxine or you know, Pristique uh, for a while. Uh, you know, a good three or four months and not responding and is compliant with that medication. Um, I mean, you can have an alternative of uh, a switch to an SSRI. Uh, uh, it's a reasonable approach to take. Uh, uh, fluoxetine is an SSRI which has been shown to be effective in PTSD. Trazodone for sleep is not uh, as harmful as uh, Zolpidem is. Um, and, you know, if you don't have the resources to resource to a PTSD, refer to a PTSD program, which has the ability for cognitive therapy, is a reasonable approach also, in my opinion. So, uh, is there any other comments uh, there? I think there's a comment if you want to address, uh, Tom, about uh, uh, eye moment desensitization and reprocessing, EMDR. Well, you mentioned that, uh, Ashwin, why don't you take that one? Yeah, so the, the question was, I mean, is, would it be recommended? Uh, so there is evidence, you know, just like I mentioned, there's been evidence for cognitive reprocessing therapy. There's been evidence for prolonged exposure therapy. So it's one of the therapies which has been studied, including in controlled trials. Uh, so in my opinion, it's not like the only recommendation in terms of cognitive therapy. It's best that uh, a patient is uh, seen by somebody who is uh, a CBD expert, and then you go over various options and figure out what's the best uh, option uh, for that particular patient. So uh, I wouldn't say it's either EMDR or prolonged exposure therapy. Um, I think both have been shown to be effective. So has been a cognitive processing therapy. Okay. Any other comments? Oh, looks like that's it. Okay, so I think we brought AH into the arena of uh, evidence-based treatment, uh, and hopefully uh, she'll do well with this particular program, a combination of uh, a, a SSRI or SNRI and uh, psychotherapeutic uh, uh, cognitive reprocessing treatment and support. So without further questions, we're gonna move on to our second case which is the case of PG, who suffers with a cannabis use disorder and a co-occurring uh, affective disorder. So PG is a 33-year-old married, father of two sons, who's working currently as a veterinary assistant, uh, where he's worked for the past 12 years. He presents as a referral from his primary care physician to your outpatient office for consultation regarding quote, help in managing stress. He states that while he likes his job, it's the only job he's ever had since graduating from college, and he finds the job less challenging than he would like. He relates that he's reluctant to seek other employment as he believes he would, quote, fail a drug test, unquote. Upon further inquiry, PG relates that he's been smoking three to four, three to six joints or using his vapor loaded with THC cartridges for several years, beginning in high school. He spends about $100 or more a week on these. He began using cannabis in high school, initially only smoking a couple hits with friends. Over time, he's used more cannabis as it seemed to take the edge off. He has strong cravings to use on a daily basis. I don't know why that happened. Uh, looks like it went two, two slides ahead. 
He reports liking how cannabis decreases his anxiety, although he thinks the cannabis sometimes makes him paranoid with consequences that he would avoid friends and family. Over the past year, he identified conflicts and arguments with his wife over his use of cannabis. He believes it prevents him from being present with his family and is concerned about how much he's spending. He regrets missing an important reception for her work and missing some sporting events for his children, for which he has come up with excuses. He realized, however, that he ended up smoking more than he had attended and lost track of time. He also reports that when trying to cut down on his marijuana use, he feels anxious, particularly in social situations, something he recalls being a problem as early as when he was in primary school. He's had no prime previous contact with mental health professionals, though a school counselor once suggested a psychiatric referral during high school due to some absences and excessive shyness. He remains highly anxious when in groups and tends to avoid these situations. What is your diagnostic assessment of PG? A, his symptoms are not out of the ordinary. There should be no psychiatric or substance use disorder that is appropriate. B, PG is suffering from social anxiety disorder only. C, PG has social anxiety disorder and co-occurring cannabis use disorder, severe. Or D, PG has cannabis use disorder with moderate severity only. Getting a lot of C votes. A lot of C? Yeah. Okay, all right. Uh, can someone uh, elaborate upon the severe characterization of his cannabis use disorder? I, when I was reading the narrative, it looks like he has at least six, at least six of the um, items in the DSM-5 category, so. Okay, so any more than four would put him into a severe category. Uh, I, think, uh, I think six is correct. I think that mm -hmm. uh, the person is dead on. Yeah, okay. Any other comments about the, your diagnosis with PG? Everybody agree that social anxiety disorder is an appropriate diagnosis? There's one more comment about um, the need for a neuropsych evaluation. Okay, could we have that individual uh, elaborate on the reason for that? Well, don't, don't, I mean, isn't the, the qualifier for any diagnosis is, uh, you know, is this better explained by substance use? So I don't know that you would be able to diagnose uh, any sort of anything other than cannabis abuse. In in this, you know, I mean, how you how do you know what's going on here? What is what? I, I'd be very very reluctant to make any diagnosis at one point in time. Okay, so you would make the diagnosis of cannabis use disorder, but not social anxiety disorder. Yeah, I mean, it, it'd be a, a reasonable working diagnosis, but you've got to appreciate that you really have very limited understanding of what is what at this point in time. Okay, so how would, a, how, would, how would neuropsych testing help us separate that out? Well, you, you know, I would hopefully be in the, in the setting of some, some level of sobriety, but, uh, you, you know, you might get some objective measures of, of what's really going on, how anxious is he really, you know, I mean, it, it would be a part of the picture, you know, and honestly, it would also stall for time, you know. You'd get some more visits, a more linear understanding of, of what's going on, um, you know, without acting like you know too much to start with. I think that's kind of okay. dangerous. Okay. There's any, another any... Um, chat message agreeing, agreeing with that, saying it's hard to diagnose a mood disorder with long-term substance use. That's certainly a very defensible position. That's a very, very common uh, presenting problem with somebody using any substances for a period of time. Perhaps the, the other uh, psychiatric symptoms that are being described are secondary. Uh, 
and that there's not a primary diagnosis. Ashwin, do you have a comment about that? I think uh, Josh Dittmer makes a fair point. So does the other, uh, Nick, that it's hard to make a diagnosis of a psychiatric disorder in the presence of an active substance use disorder. That is a given. Uh, in, and particularly in the absence of any collateral history or investigations. Uh, but here's the clinical scenario which often people are going to face, certainly in an outpatient setting, is uh, uh, in, unless your approach is going to be, I'm going to detox everybody in an inpatient setting and then figure out what's right or wrong, you are never going to get to that quickly. Uh, the best you hope for is you can get objective information from someone else and you'll have to make at least a working diagnosis and this is not going to be right or wrong it's either way you can make a call it, it's based on how um, conservative of, of an approach you need to have you'll have to make a working diagnosis and start planning treatment if a patient is coming in this case what tom has mentioned with the history and if you think that's a reliable history um, uh, even before the cannabis use started of, uh, you know, having uh, social anxiety, avoidance behaviors. Um, and if you think that's reliable, uh, it may be worth considering that that may be a contributing factor. Um, as I said earlier on, right at the introduction, that uh, patients who are going to come into treatment, uh, comorbidity is the norm. I mean, that has been shown over and over again uh, uh, the populations where you see only substance use are non-treatment seeking community populations. Those who come into, so just be aware that the threshold, uh, particularly if you are not going to say that, well, you only have social anxiety disorder and not a substance use disorder. That's not what we are saying. We're saying that could it be possibly has it? Uh, he certainly has the symptoms. now. Can it be explained in the, by substance use? It may or may not be explained. It's, uh, it's very hard to be 100% sure. So I, you could go either way. That would be my comment. Sarah, are there any other comments? Uh, no, that's it. Okay, right, let's learn a little bit more about PG here. So what advice will you provide to PG? Will you advise that he cut back on his use of cannabis and offer reassurance that his difficulties are likely to resolve if he reduces his cannabis use? Would you offer education relating to the nature of addictive disorders, suggest complete abstinence from the use of cannabis and THC with further evaluation and treatment for social anxiety disorder? Would you recommend marital therapy? Would you provide a prescription for paroxetine to address social anxiety and reassure? PG will naturally will, will likely naturally reduce his use of cannabis as it is likely being used as self-medication. We have any responses to, uh, to I these think questions? there are B, uh, B uh, as uh, multiple responses. Yes, yeah, several Bs. Okay. Any other comments? Do you want to do you want to comment, Ashwin, about this? Uh, I think it's a. Uh, I think sounds pretty comprehensive. B uh, and um, yeah. uh, the. Uh, up, I think I like the comment which was uh, there that, that the longest answer is always right. So, yeah, so, yeah, so I, there, I this is com compatible with the comments that were made uh, by uh, the individual uh, about difficulty of diagnosing a psychiatric illness in the context of a clear cannabis use disorder. It sounds like everybody agrees is cannabis use disorder severe is an appropriate diagnosis here and we're not sure about social anxiety disorder. But if he stops use of cannabis, we can then evaluate. So let's move to the next uh, episode here. So following your discussion about the effects that cannabis use has on his life, PG decides that his use is causing significant problems in his life. He requests your assistance as he attempts to stop using completely. You schedule a follow-up appointment for two weeks. 
One week later, PG phones your office complaining of increase in anxiety, irritability, difficulty falling asleep, and a general feeling of malaise. He also has a persistent headache and his hands are shaky. His message suggests that if he cannot get some relief, he will probably go back to smoking weed in order for him to function at work and reduce conflict at home. He's called in sick on the day of his call as he feels he cannot function at work. What is most likely going on here? Reemergence of anxiety relating to his anxiety disorder. PG is demonstrating signs of cannabis withdrawal. C, PG is seeking you're okay to return to the use of cannabis. Or D, his symptoms are inconsistent with cessation of cannabis use and another explanation is in order. We have some B answer and a B and C answer. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. Well, I'm glad we didn't make these mutually exclusive. Yeah. Lots of B's <laughs> and a B and C. Any other comments? Uh, anybody want to make a, a statement? So it looks like so which I'm really uh, happy that the group agrees that. Uh, uh, Cannabis withdrawal as a syndrome is present. Uh, and that I think is a, uh, I'm glad there's an agreement on that. Uh, I mean, Tom um, edited a book <laughs> which uh, was written on behalf of North Carolina Psychiatric uh, Association on, uh, on cannabis and a variety of uh, aspects relating to cannabis. Um, I can put a plug in for that, it's still available. Um, <laughs> uh, 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 and uh, on Amazon. Uh, so, uh, uh, but cannabis withdrawal uh, is recognized in DSM-5. Uh, David Gorlick, who uh, was one of our collaborators and who did speak at our earlier conferences uh, in Asheville, uh, has done great studies to document that presence. Is this patient has certainly, it's like three out of seven symptoms and this patient probably has five out of seven. So um, uh, it's, uh, it's something to be aware of and it's something I find very helpful to educate, uh, uh, particularly adolescents uh, and maybe even baby boomers who I see uh, uh, that uh, you will get a withdrawal syndrome uh, with regular use. Yeah, I think the takeaway point is here is we uh, should have notified uh, PG of the likelihood that he was going to be feeling worse before he felt better uh, and developed a bit of a contingency plan. So uh, he's kind of panicking now. So let's see what happens. Yeah. Tom, can I just so, quickly interrupt just to give people a, uh, like an idea of what, uh, so studies have been done where if, uh, if somebody has been using marijuana three or more times a week in the previous year, they reported at least uh, two symptoms. 30% of them reported at least two symptoms of uh, cannabis withdrawal. If you used it more often than that, the numbers climbed um, progressively. So uh, this is not something that is uncommon. And I think Tom rightly points out that is something that a patient needs to be educated on. Particularly if people are using it regularly, uh, it's, a, it's a high possibility. Okay. Are there any other comments about this particular issue, cannabis withdrawal? Oh, here's something. Okay, next decision point. One more, one okay. more. Um, shouldn't we have given him some medication to help with withdrawal when he was first seen? Tom, did you hear that? I heard it. Yeah. So yeah. I, uh, I, I think there's some wisdom to that. I think, uh, the, you know, the, the issue is that there's no clear uh, indication of what medication might be helpful with cannabis withdrawal. There have been some studies with dronabinol that have been somewhat positive, uh, but we don't have good evidence to uh, offer uh, any specific advice about what would be effective with cannabis withdrawal. Yeah, as we go on in this case, you're going to see what was actually done. Uh, and there's always the option of giving some sort of general anti-anxiety agent 
uh, to help get over the hump. Uh, Ashwin, do you have a... Uh... I would agree. I think as you proceed forward, you might see some evidence about some things, but uh, uh, we, as of now, I mean, there's no drug up, uh, approved and the studies generally that have been done with anti-anxiety agents like SSRIs, Abuspiron, uh, they have not been promising. As Tom, uh, Tom mentioned, uh, uh, Marinol uh, or Dronabinol uh, has been shown to be effective. It's very difficult to get it. Um, I have used uh, Nabilon or Sesamet. Uh, that's also very expensive to get. And it's all off-label, by the way. Uh, these are uh, medications. Marinol is synthetic THC approved uh, to treat chemotherapy-induced nausea and vomiting and AIDS-related wasting syndromes. And Nabilon uh, is approved to treat chemotherapy-induced uh, nausea and vomiting. And the third one, which is the most recent one, which is CBD, um, Epidolex, uh, that's approved to treat only seizure disorder in children. So it's all off-label at the moment, and that's the reason Tom mentioned we don't have any uh, good medications as of now. Right. You know, so from the, from the literature point of view, there are two meta-analyses on this issue of cannabis withdrawal and what medications to use. And they've both concluded that there is no effectiveness for anything uh, that would justify a, a recommendation. So um, that doesn't mean we shouldn't be doing something or developing a contingency plan uh, with uh, PG uh, and anticipate uh, what we might do. Uh, and so it's left to your clinical judgment. So what would you advise uh, PG? Would you recommend an SSRI to treat anxiety disorder? Explain to PG that he's having recognized the symptoms associated with cessation of long-term use of cannabis and that the most acute symptoms are likely to resolve in a week or 10 days and offer a short course of benzodiazepines to reduce distress. Tell PG to be patient and refer for substance use counseling to reduce risk of relapse? Or would you refer him to the ED to facilitate hospitalization? Any takers on these, uh, these choices? Not even getting any chat votes. No chats, huh? <laughs> So I, I would, you know, I guess we we'll, we probably all agree that B would be the best approach here. Education is primary here, and uh, uh, letting uh, letting PG know that there is some discomfort associated with discontinuing. And I, I would not be opposed in this case to offering a short course of benzodiazepines uh, to uh, allow him to have some decrease in his anxiety level while he goes through this. Would there be individuals who would disagree with that? I, I think the only caveat I would have, uh, Tom, is if we are going to prescribe benzodiazepines uh, is to make sure that we monitor for the risk of right. appropriate mm -hmm. use as prescribed. And uh, it's the short course means uh, a week or less. Because that's mm -hmm. the general course of uh, as Tom pointed out, uh, of the cannabis withdrawal symptoms, the intense symptoms are usually uh, subsiding by end of first week. Would anybody refer for hospitalization? I think we just ran out of choices there. But <laughs> okay, so PG returns for a follow-up appointment and thanks you for your prescription of diazepam. And it's, it's helped him reduce his anxiety and irritability and allowed him to get some sleep. He does express, however, his concern they'd be better off returning to marijuana. He asked for additional amounts of benzodiazepines. He also notes that he is more avoidant of social situations and his wife is losing patience with him. How would you approach PG's request for pharmacotherapy of his symptoms? A. Explain that if he can tough it out, symptoms are likely to remit over the next few weeks. B, advise treatment with an SSRI antidepressant to address social anxiety and refer for substance use counseling for both him and his wife with follow-up in one to two weeks. C, continue to prescribe benzodiazepine for anxiety and insomnia. 
Or D, offer a prescription for bupropion and buspirone to address anxiety and depressive disorder. There are obviously other choices that you can make and we would invite you to add to this if uh, you have some ideas that are outside of what's been offered here. Let's have some takers on this one. What, what, what kind of- I think most answers are B, Tom. Uh huh. Like on okay. almost a universal agreement on B. Okay. So are we uh, I thought saying those are from before? No, I'm sorry. Not. Go ahead. No, oh, you're right. Is that from before? Uh, the the first half of them are the second half. Uh, okay. Yeah. Okay. All right. So we uh, we have have we just settled then on a diagnosis of social anxiety disorder? Yeah, that's the first question. We have this dilemma where he's withdrawing from cannabis. We suspect he may have social anxiety or some anxiety disorder. Uh, and he gets increased anxiety. And we don't know, again, whether it's coming from withdrawal or from social anxiety. So would we want to add an additional uh, uh, pharmacotherapy element here, or would we want to wait? Certainly think it's a good idea to get his wife in, because it sounds like this is there's a considerable amount of marital conflict that's complicating the situation. There may be other approaches. Does anyone have a different approach? Okay, no, no, no comments, there. I can't see the chat. So. No, no comments. Oh, right. just got one. Okay. I find that offering an SSRI to someone who has had THC and a benzo will not be met with gratitude. <laughs> Well, it's true that uh, SSRIs don't reduce anxiety nearly as well as benzodiazepines. <laughs> so, and I'm sure we've all run into that dilemma where uh, patients have experienced the dramatic reduction in their anxiety due to use of diazepam or Xanax and uh, the SSRI just not compare. <laughs> Ashwin, do you have any comments about this one? Uh I think in this case is reasonable. Uh, you have the wife coming in, uh, telling you that you know he has been drawn from cannabis, and he's still he's avoiding social situations even more. So you've got absence of a drug, uh, 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 which might be contributing to anxiety. Got some information from the wife. It's reasonable to make the diagnosis, at least a working diagnosis of social anxiety, and then and, and proceed accordingly to treat it. All right, any other comments? Okay, I'm gonna move on. So he comes for his follow-up appointment and his wife accompanies him. So PG reports that his wife has been more supportive as she now understands about the challenges of recovering from addictive disorders. He notes, however, that his anxiety is in better control. He's returned to work. Your drug screen, however, continues to show positive for THC. What is your next step in managing PG's comorbidities? A, confront PG about his obvious continued use of cannabis. B, continue the SSRI, obtain consent, and educate the spouse about your plan of treatment and prognosis for improvement with current approach. Would you discharge a patient from your care as there's no evidence for pharmacological treatment of cannabis use disorder or order quantitative THC levels to verify the absence of cannabis use. So PG is feeling better. Presumably the SSRI has made some dent in his social anxiety and or whatever anxiety he's suffering, uh, but he's apparently continuing uh, to use, TH to use uh, cannabis. We have a vote for D, vote for A, 
a vote for recommending that he move to Colorado. <laughs> Why only Colorado? There are 11 states. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Maybe, uh, maybe uh, you, could join, you could join the normal lobby, I guess. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> okay, so now we've had D, so, but, um, we've yeah, had but D I, and... Yeah, okay. I think it's worth knowing that, um, uh, you know, urine drug screen positive for THC does not necessarily mean that the person is using it that day. You know, it takes a while uh, for it to be um, reducing, but uh, the patient is better uh, and uh, uh, is, has a wife who is engaged. Um, uh, so you have SSRIs which are effective uh, in treatment of, uh, uh, of social anxiety and uh, I think it should be a good idea to continue that. Um, and if you're on the right track, generally it's a good idea to stay on the right track. Now, you do need to look at the THC and see how you're best going to address it. And I think uh, that's going to be uh, the next question. I think if there's a comment about from Kavi about screening for uh, ethanol, and I would absolutely agree that someone who has social anxiety disorder uh, and cannabis uh, should be screened for alcohol use. Also, Excellent. I just wanted to add that we don't know whether or not they've been, they did a um, THC level at onset. So the levels may be decreasing because as we know with THC, it takes a long while for it to get out of your system. So if the levels are decreasing, we can look at that to help assure that he's decreasing his use or he may, if the levels don't increase then I guess we could use that as well to see that he's making changes in his use. Yeah. So, uh, Comment, there was a question about how do we treat social anxiety. So SSRIs are the first line. So, uh, uh, you know, Paxil, Zoloft, and Luox have been approved, and then Effexor. So SNRIs can be tried also, but generally it's SSRIs as first line, and then SNRIs, uh, if for whatever reason SSRIs are uh, ineffective or not tolerated. And, of, and then... If somebody has social anxiety relating to episodes of public speaking or something of that sort, beta blockers such as propranolol have also found to be effective. Um, exposure and desensitization through counseling uh, is uh, and should be, in my opinion, a part of the treatment. Are there any other comments out there? I think there's a question. Uh, I think there's a question about is buspiron a useful um, Tom, what's your experience with bisparon for social anxiety? Well, you you, know, you referred to the uh, worker from the UK, and I heard him give yeah. a talk about buspar one time, and he said that yeah. buspar is uh, is the ideal drug. It has everything you want in a drug except efficacy. So, <laughs> <laughs> I've, I've had some success with generalized anxiety disorder, but I I don't, I don't find it to be terribly useful, and certainly not in situations like social anxiety disorder and never uh, have I seen it work for panic disorder. Yeah, I would agree. So Tom gives you the answer, which I would say is the correct evidence-based answer in terms of this for all. So, uh, all right. Okay, so we move on? Before, yeah. Okay, so the, the, the salient point here is the THC is gonna be positive for a while, up to six weeks or eight weeks. <laughs> Yeah. even if he's discontinued his use. So we don't want to confront. Considering his analysis acknowledges his continued use of cannabis, and he asserts his belief that the use of marijuana serves as a treatment for his depressive illness. He states that he's had intermittent periods of depression beginning at age 17. For the first time, he reveals a history of mental disorder in his father, who was diagnosed with bipolar disorder. He further reports that he's had periods of depression in the past that have lasted six to eight weeks during which he's had little motivation and sleeps for long hours. It's during these periods that he finds it most difficult to go to work. When he does go, he has difficulty keeping up with the pace of settling animals for examination. Which of the following information would be helpful in making a diagnosis more specific for PG? A a history of distinct periods of abnormally and persistently elevated expansive and irritable mood, activity, decreased need for sleep and increase in goal-directed activity, B, a family history of generalized anxiety disorder, 
C, the presence of forced thoughts that cannot be avoided or suppressed, or D, the persistent use of cannabis despite adverse consequences to his marriage and work. Any takers on this one? We've got a, a B and an all of the above. Okay. No other votes yet. All right, well, that um, would be... Here's an A. Mm -hmm. Lots of A's. Okay. Ashwin, you want to make com any comment about this one? Nope. I think when you have uh, a patient with substance use disorder, uh, in terms of psychiatric disorders, you saw the risk which goes up with mood disorders, uh, which is you know even higher than anxiety disorders. So it's always a good idea even if somebody's com coming to you with symptoms of anxiety disorder to screen for mood disorder. And in this patient, if you have uh, episodes suggestive of depressive episodes, uh, uh, and this is a common you know, mistake, all of us, uh, I have made this mistake also, which is not to take a good history of any hypomanic or manic episodes. I mean, if, if you have got a depressive episode, Particularly in this context, it's a good idea to take it. Uh, Sir, are there so, any, any other comments coming in on this? No. Okay. All right, so what are the criteria for mania? Uh, they're listed here. Uh, I'm not gonna read them, but uh, it, it does make a lot of sense. And I, I think that when we deal with patients with, uh, with depressive illness, uh, re what appears to be recurrent depressive illness, we frequently don't take the time to take a, a history relating to hypomanic or manic episodes. Uh, it's ex extremely important in terms of treatment choices uh, and it might make a big difference in our approach toward uh, PG here. Um, so you inquire now about the presence of manic or hypomanic episodes. And PG responds by referring to several periods in his life when he's had a lot of energy and drive and required less than three hours sleep lasting for a few weeks. During one of these periods, he had applied for admission to vet school and was invited for interviews, but he never followed up for reasons that he cannot explain. He states that he just lost interest at the time. What next steps in PG's care might you advise? A, reinforce the need to address his daily cannabis use. Two, inform PG that there is a high likelihood that he suffered with a bipolar disorder and requires additional pharmacological treatment. Three, refer for psychodynamic-based psychotherapy. Or four, advise that he avoids stressful situations. Who, want to, who wants to make a run at this one? We have several answers, which are two, a couple, which are two and three. Okay. Uh, so, uh, um, I think people would generally agree that uh, there's a high likelihood he has bipolar disorder if he has episodes, which meets criteria for depression and uh, mania. Okay. Uh, uh, but there are issues about three psychodynamic based psychotherapy. Um, so in a patient who has active substance use or active mood disorder, particularly bipolar disorder, uh, the evidence is that psychodynamic based psychotherapy uh, may require first stabilization of their disorders. Uh, and uh, there might be a role for therapy, uh, but uh, stabilization of their psychiatric disorders is going to be important. Okay, so PG is already uh on an SSRI, uh, that's helped his anxiety. Uh, and now he's describing depressive symptoms. What kind of approach should we take to the depressive symptoms? That's a great question for the audience. So, uh, well, uh, all right. So people are commenting on using mood stabilizers such as uh, lithium or valproic acid. Okay, any other comments? 
Okay, so you suggest that PG's depressive symptoms are likely due to bipolar disorder and may need additional pharmacotherapy beyond addressing his cannabis use. PG reluctantly agrees of which, of, of the following, which agent would be the most likely to be effective in targeting bipolar depression? One, begin venlafaxine at 75 milligrams for two weeks. Two, arrange for PG's urgent hospitalization. Three, continue your current approach and reassure PG that depressive symptoms are likely to rebent with time or begin a mood stabilizer such as lorazidone 20 milligrams daily. We have a vote for four, several four votes, a lamictal vote. More four. Okay. Okay, all of those would uh, be appropriate. I think the strongest evidence uh, for treating bipolar depression or treatment with lorazidone or uh, with quetiapine. Uh, there is some evidence for uh, lamictal and uh, for lithium has been mentioned before. There, there's little evidence that valproate is helpful in the depressed phase of bipolar disorder, uh, but it is helpful in uh, stabilizing mood in a patient who's euthymic. Uh, uh, Ashwin, do you have any comments uh, on that? Uh, so the only comment I would have is that uh, almost all the studies uh, of bipolar disorder would recommend using a mood stabilizer to manage the depressed phase, uh, not just antidepressants alone. So antidepressants alone are not as effective as using mood stabilizers to manage the depressed phase of bipolar disorder. There's evidence that studies done on that. We recently completed a study which showed uh, that the antidepressants did not have a prophylactic efficacy for uh, uh, bipolar depression. Um, in, and if you have a mood stabilizer, uh, that often uh, is sufficient. Yeah, so it probably makes sense to comment that uh, the presence of bipolar depression is a reason for uh, refractory depression when, uh, when a patient presents without a history of a manic episode, but uh, has had a, a depressive episode and is placed on a, a, either an SSRI or an SNRI and doesn't respond. Uh, and of all uh, patients who present, 70% uh, of the time they present with, with their first effective episode as a depressive episode. So you don't have the history that would allow you to make the bipolar diagnosis. So you have to rely on family history early onset, and perhaps uh, sub, what's called subclinical episodes of hypomania. Um, okay, so I'm going to move on and let's see what happens. One more question, Tom? Oh, yeah, yep, go ahead. Mm -hmm. Can Vralar help with mood stabilization and decrease substance abuse? Uh, well, I would say yes, uh, the Vralar would be a possible choice here. Ashwin, do you have a comment about that? It's approved. So it would be a perfectly reasonable choice. I mean, my, Tom mentioned already about, you know, the various medications from the antipsychotic class, uh, including quetiapine, uh, which were uh, approved. So cariprazine, which is Vrelar, uh, is a perfectly reasonable choice. Uh, it costs $1,217 for a month's prescription. Uh, just so that you know, I just found that out last <laughs> week. So uh, okay. uh, uh, lunacidone is not very cheap either, but... Just uh, uh, be aware that these uh, newer medications, uh, uh, they are devilishly expensive. Yeah, One more question. How, yep. often do, how often does an SSRI induce mania? I think that's a controversial issue. Uh, so uh, it's fairly clear that uh, the old tricyclic antidepressants were associated with induction of uh, hypomania or manic episodes and bipolar patients. Uh, I think the, uh, the studies that I've read suggest that uh, venlafaxine is the one that's most commonly associated with with a switch from depression to mania, and that there's no clear evidence that uh, just the pure SSRIs uh, are associated with hypomania. Maybe maybe Ashwin has a different take on this. So it's you know I think uh, what Tom said is correct, which is most of the data we have. Uh, has to be, has come from older tricyclics. Um, 
So uh, I don't know the exact percentages. The STEP BD study, which is the STEP uh, study done specifically looking at bipolar disorder and um, uh, the uh, uh, various treatments that were effective, including uh, whether antidepressants induce it or not, that it was in, infrequent. That's all I can say. That in, I can't remember the exact percentages. Uh, you know, uh, but the step BD study showed that it was uh, infrequent, but it does exist. Uh, I think uh, the, uh, I just don't, I mean, they are, with the newer medications, the rates are far lower than what we used to find with the tricyclics. That's all I know. I think they are maybe five or tenfold lower. I don't know the exact numbers, but the step BD study can give uh, the actual rates in that uh, study of how, what was SSRI and perhaps SNRI-induced uh, mania. Yeah. <clears throat> Nonetheless, I would emphasize that uh, current guidance uh, would strongly suggest that if you're going to put a bipolar uh, depressed patient on uh, any kind of antidepressant, that you add a mood stabilizer first. And that, I think, is the key point, that almost all guidelines for treatment of bipolar depression would indicate uh, uh, use of a uh, mood stabilizer. Yeah. Okay. Are there any other comments, uh, Sarah? No, that's it. Okay. All right. So you offer to prescribe lorazodone and explain the possible side effects, including sedation early in treatment and possible feelings of motor restlessness that are unusual but may occur. You provide further education relating to bipolar disorder and the goals of treatment. You advise him to take the medication with meals. You schedule a follow-up visit in two weeks and advise him to notify you of any concerns. Upon return, PG reports that he's filled the prescription and has taken it as advised. He acknowledges that he's feeling less down and is functioning better at work. He's not had any side effects, but notes some lingering depression. He continues to use cannabis daily, however, and feels that this is necessary in order to treat any residual anxiety. He seeks your support to continue to use, as it is clear to him that many states have approved it as effective medication. Which of the following statements about the daily use of cannabis are supported by current evidence? One, cannabis has demonstrated benefit in the treatment of anxiety, PTSD, and bipolar depression. Two, cannabis products are safe and do not have addictive potential. Three, data from prospective observational studies suggest that daily use of cannabis is associated with reduced measured IQ, that for adolescents is only partially reversible upon discontinuation, or four, smoking marijuana is not associated with respiratory complications. What, what yeah, kind of, a lot of threes, uh, Tom. A lot of threes, okay. Yeah. All right, any ones? Doesn't look, uh, <laughs> don't see any ones. Okay. So everybody's in agreement that smoking marijuana uh, is not, has uh, been shown to have benefit for anxiety, PTSD, and bipolar depression. Uh, I think there have been some studies showing that use of marijuana and PTSD is, uh, is contraindicated. Uh, and, uh, I don't know of any studies with bipolar depression that have uh, have been done with cannabis, frankly. Yeah. Uh, clearly, smoking marijuana is associated with respiratory uh, complications. And if you listened to, to the lecture earlier today, you can see that cannabis products uh, clearly have addictive potential. Yeah. Hey, Tom, I just want to come back to the question of uh, the antidepressant-induced uh, mania. The so the rates mm -hmm. with uh, SSRIs uh, have been reported between three to five percent. Oh, interesting. Okay. Yeah. So in two studies, and it depends how long they were studied. But one study went on almost for uh, uh, nine to ten months, so close to a year. So that's uh, it's good to know. But almost all studies have shown an an increased risk lower than tricyclics. And as Tom mm -hmm. rightly pointed out, in terms of uh, venlafaxine has been consistently associated uh, mm -hmm. uh, uh, with that risk. So, um, so number three, which is correct, I think uh, for people, there's a great study. I think it was uh, Meyer et al. I don't know exactly what journal it was, but that's the study where which uh, 
looked at longitudinal assessment of adolescents before they started cannabis and followed them up throughout the period they started cannabis. Almost all the other studies were cross-sectional and you can't really comment cross-sectionally uh, because the best control is yourself in any studies of IQ. So that study uh, showed uh, what is mentioned here, uh, which is that it was not fully reversible. And I think their follow-up was one to two years. Tom, you may know about how long was the follow-up abstinence. Uh, yeah, I think it was 18 months. So Yeah, 18 months, one to two years. Mm -hmm. So yeah. that probably is the best study which shows us uh, uh, what number three says. Okay. Sarah, any other comments? No. Coming in? No, but okay. No. All right, so after two months of uh, follow-up, after two follow-up visits and an adjustment of the lorazidone dosage to 40 milligrams, PG reports that he's convinced that the medication is helping his depression. But he continues to believe this use of cannabis is contributing positively. Which of the following approaches are most likely to lead PG to action to address his cannabis use? Marital counseling, a series of motivational interviews, group therapy, or the passage of time? We've got to move on here a little bit because we're running out of time and we still have a few more issues to deal with here. So, a couple uh, of two what, votes. A couple, a couple of twos. One for two, one for three. Okay. All right. I think uh, that. Uh, I think both the, are appropriate. Either, either of those would be appropriate? Yeah. Yes. Okay. So after three months, PG returns having participated in a series of motivational interviews during which he comes to the conclusion that his daily use of cannabis is causing more harm than good. He's tentatively ready to stop using and he states that since you helped him with his depression, he will take your advice in regard to freeing himself from the use of cannabis since he's clearly unable to stop on his own. Which of the following would be your next step in addressing the treatment of his cannabis use disorder? One, prescribe an exercise regimen of brisk walking two miles a day. Continue contact with motivational enhancement, adding referral for cognitive behavior therapist with rewards for participation and abstinence, adding acetylcysteine to reduce cravings. Three, prescribe three month course of baclofen to reduce symptoms of withdrawal or advise stopping cannabis offering support and follow up in one month. Comments? Votes are just starting. Here's a, a two. Okay. I think a it's one. one, one and two also. I think yeah. exercise never hurts. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, I think we have quite a few comments on exercise uh, uh, as well as number two, Tom. Okay, so we have conflicting evidence for N-acetyl cysteine, which has been found to be uh, to improve outcomes in adolescents, but not in adults. Uh, but uh, we uh, clearly have evidence for uh, psychotherapeutic intervention uh, using uh, cognitive therapy or group therapy uh, in reducing uh, the uh, or improving outcomes for cannabis use. Uh, Ashwin, do you have some comments on that? The only caveat I would say is that in terms of uh, uh, adverse events uh, with n cysteine, there are hardly any adverse events. So uh, there is, in my opinion, no harm to trying it. I, have, I use it for cannabis withdrawal, um, even though there, like Tom said, that the adult study was negative. Uh, the adolescent study was positive and there were some limitations in the adult study. So there's no harm using that, but cornerstone remains uh, behavioral approaches. Any other comments or questions? I think exercise in general is, uh, is good. Um, there was a randomized control trial which we were involved in called the STRIDE trial uh, for treatment of substance use disorders. And to our great disappointment, we did not find uh, a strong effect. And I think that this was because uh, there was a uh, what we call a placebo effect, which was very high uh, in the control group. So it was very difficult to control for exercise, as you can imagine. And right. that's what we found that uh, everybody started exercising, including people who were told not to exercise. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And that's what happened. So, all right. 
<laughs> All right. So you continue, uh, you suggest continued psychotherapy and you prescribe N-acetyl cysteine, 1200 milligrams twice a day. Tell PG to call with any questions or concern and revisit in one month. PG returns reporting adherence to the agreed treatment plan. His UDS is negative for all drugs of abuse, including THC. He's returned to work, notes improvement in his level of anxiety, and has reported no subjective depression. All right. Well, uh, all of us say hallelujah uh, for that. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, the last so point... I want to I add one other thing to this story that is only partially apocryphal. Uh, and that's that uh, that PG has applied to uh, and been accepted at veterinary school. Oh, wow. That's great. That's wonderful. Wow. So on that positive note, uh, I just wanted to have one or two slides in the last five minutes because, you know, it's a hot topic about CBD. And can you use it for marijuana withdrawal? Can you use it for marijuana dependence? And really the evidence so far we have for CBD, uh, Epidolex is the drug that has been approved. It's a Schedule 5 drug for seizure disorder. But almost all the evidence has to do with neuropathic pain. Okay, uh, uh, so and there is now emerging evidence that it might be able to, you know, effective in some other chronic pain syndromes. But most of the data is from preclinical animal and some human volunteer experiments. Uh, there are some study, I think there are six uh, uh, small controlled trials, uh, which showed that um, it may be effective in anxiety. Uh, but there are limitations in those trials. The largest number of subjects was 79. So you've got 14 each group. It's hard to know whether it worked or not. Most of those studies were done in social anxiety disorder, by the way, not generalized anxiety disorder. And there's some evidence it were, may uh, have some antipsychotic effects. There's no evidence that so far that it's working uh, in insomnia. So that's the evidence of CBD we have so far. Um, I'm reading a book uh, written uh, by Kevin Hill again, who spoke at our previous conference, a new one. He got a new one out and uh, let me see if there's some new data there. But this is really the data so far we have on CBD. So as of now, we don't have any studies of CBD to treat cannabis dependence uh, or cannabis withdrawal. Uh, so uh, stay posted. I'm sure we are going to see more data. And I think we are ending uh, perfectly uh, on time. There's one question, uh, Tom, which came up uh, about uh, baclofen for uh, withdrawal. Uh, and uh, uh, I, don't, I don't think that uh, I've seen any positive data for baclofen for cannabis withdrawal. So baclofen's been studied to death for practically everything in the, in the yeah. substance use area and has never really come up with anything. So I, I, I don't think that it's uh, been widely accepted and certainly I don't think we can include it as evidence-based practice. Yeah. All right, well, I think that's all we have to say. You know, thank you all for okay. uh, being here yep. with us on a Saturday afternoon you know, and being so interactive. No, thank you, yes. Dr. Pender, okay. Dr. Ashton. All right.